Okay, uh, I told you when we were starting this process that what I would sometimes do with these lectures is um, use them as an opportunity to connect what you're learning to things that you're seeing uh, in your life every day. And well, we don't see anything these days quite like we see COVID-19. Um, so you just went through a discussion of your peripheral nervous system. Um, and, and that's where I really want to jump off here because, you know, as, as some of you may know, I've, I've created a course to help people manage their anxiety during COVID. I'll, I'll direct you to that course at the end of this um, lecture. Um, but I'm going to give you a little taste of some of the stuff I talk about uh, at the beginning uh, of that course. So let's jump into it. I think my headphones just died. I don't need them anyway. So there we go. Wow feel liberated. All right, let's jump in. So central nervous system, I mean, just to get some of these terms straight, you, you know now that the central nervous system is your brain and there's in fact brain tissue right down your spinal cord. Now the kind of interesting, you know, way to think of this is, is if we imagine that's us, you know, we live somewhere in our central nervous system, that sense that we have of a self, that's probably where it is, but it's all encased in bone. It's encased in bone to protect it, right? The brain is is a very fragile thing and, and damage can lead to extreme problems. So it's highly protected with this hard skull and even down the whole back, the spine provides protection. Um, it's of, of course all stuck within this body, which is kind of our, our you know vehicle for negotiating around the world and interacting with it. Uh, and so the central nervous system uses the peripheral nervous system to kind of interact with the body. So that includes both getting input from the external world through our sensory neurons and such. So if something touches us, um, the central nervous system learns about it because the peripheral nervous system transmits that information and sends it to the brain. Uh, and similarly, if the brain decides it wants to do something, it wants to manipulate the external world in some way or respond in some way to it, it can now send signals through the peripheral nervous system to the muscles, okay? So the peripheral nervous system, first of all, plays that, that intermediary role um, of, of you know, providing information to the brain and allowing it to act. But the interesting thing is it has sort of two modes, two ways of being, and that's, um, oh, right. so I think I've said all that stuff. So that's where um, the interesting issue of anxiety comes in. So we talk about these modes as the parasympathetic mode and the sympathetic mode. And the way I like to think of these distinctions is the following. Imagine, you know, you've just had a tough day. You did whatever work, the day's over, you're home, uh, and you finally have a chance to relax. And so you, you know, sit in your favorite chair, you put your favorite show on television, and you sink into that chair. Um, you, your body will, in that case, be in this parasympathetic mode. And what we'll see there, we're gonna kind of highlight sort of two characteristics of it. So first of all, the organs of our body and the peripheral nervous system connects the brain to the organs in our body as well. The organs in our body start to focus on digestion. So we have more saliva in our mouth. Um, we have, our, our stomach becomes active. Uh, our gallbladder, our intestines and our bladder all what we call upregulate, which means they kind of go into action. They increase their activity level. What are they doing? They're digesting the food that you've eaten during the day, extracting the nutrients, delivering the nutrients to the body to keep it strong, removing the waste, and, and basically trying to get rid of the waste through the intestines, etc. Um, and so really we can think of this as long-term maintenance, right? It's, it's maintaining our body and keeping it strong for the long haul. Uh, at the same time as that's going on, we see our breathing reduce, our heart rate reduce, and our pupils constrict. So the first two, that just means we're relaxing, right? In a sense, we are breathing more slowly and often a little bit more deeply, uh, and our heart is beating a little more slowly. The contraction of the pupils is a suggestion that <clears throat> we're kind of less worried about the external world. Um, and so we're literally taking less light into our eye because the external world isn't all that important to us. And so we might be daydreaming a little bit, watching the TV, etc. Okay, so now, Imagine you're in that state, sitting on that chair. Imagine you're home alone. And now imagine you hear upstairs a window smash. 
and you're home alone, what happens? Well, your brain will go into sympathetic nervous system mode. Um, sympathetic nervous system mode is about short-term survival. It's almost in every way the opposite of what was happening when this parasympathetic mode was, was active. So first of all, if we think of digestion again, everything that was upregulated when we were relaxing is now downregulated. So we get a dry mouth quite often in those cases. Um, our whole digestive system kind of shuts down. It's kind of like your, your brain is saying to your body, don't worry about digestion right now. We have a problem and we have to address that problem. So it shuts down digestion and it keys up our response system. So what do I mean by that? Well, our, our heart rate increases, our breathing increases, and together what these do is they pump oxygen-rich blood to our muscles. And that's what our muscles need to be their most effective. So it literally creates the strongest, most powerful version of us that there is. It also dilates the pupils. And if you could imagine, you know, the ears don't have anything that dilate, but literally at this case, we're becoming very aware of the external world, right? Because there's something going on there. Uh, and so we're taking in more light. We're also probably taking in more sound, you know, hearing things a little bit more. And that's making us aware of what's going around. The, the heart rate and the, and the um, breathing is making us very strong and powerful. And we can feel that. It's a, it's a sort of anxiety. And cognitively, we have this feeling like we have to do something. Um, so we're not just going to sit on the couch and chill like we did in parasympathetic mode. No, we're going to do something. And typically people capture this. This is a little oversimplified, but it's an easy way to think about it. They capture it with the terms fight or flee. Um, those are the two most obvious things to do. You either go upstairs and see what the heck is going on up there and you're ready to take on that raccoon or you know, whatever it is that smashed your window. Or you think that's a scary idea and instead you get your shoes on and get the heck out of the house. Um, so you might choose to flee from whatever caused it or fight. Either way, that strength you have is going to enable you to be your best you, your best vert fighter or your best fleer um, because you have all the muscle strength you need to do it. So this mode is about short term survival. That's what it's about, getting you through this situation right now. Um, okay. So first of all, I just want to mention something and I do this for two reasons. So this is a really cool website especially for this chapter. I've got the link to it down there. I've also hyperlinked this. And I'm gonna use it to talk, to talk to you about one specific part of the brain, but I want you to see that a lot of the parts of the brain that you're learning about, you can learn more here. So let's just jump over here. All right, this is a very cool website, by the way. I absolutely love this website. Um, my internet seems a little slow today. Maybe it's because I'm uploading and downloading 30, 30 million lectures. Here we are, see how it works. Uh, yes, I know. I understand how to do this. Um, that does not look like the brain full level. Oh, it's slowly kind of coming to exist. Wow, is the internet slow? But this is kind of cool. Let's kind of watch this. Look at all the structure. So that's you're now in the midbrain. You know, you're around the, the limbic system sort of area, very primitive part of the brain there. And now we're slowly going to see. Wow, slowly. You know, maybe it's because I have 30 million tabs open too. Um, <laughs> Let me close a few. Oh, we have half a brain there. <laughs> have half a brain. Let me close some of my various Google Docs that I have going on here, uh, and we'll come back to it. And these all exist somewhere. I don't really need Kijiji right now, uh, let alone two of them. <laughs> okay, let's come back to the brain. Here we are. We have a brain now. Uh, I don't know if that helps, but this is a cool 3D brain. Okay, and so you can look at it in a bunch of ways, um, but kind of as implied. Now, each step of the way, you can learn some details about the brain. So your brain weighs about three pounds, uh, which is kind of interesting. 86 billion neurons, those neurons we just talked about. Um, and so you can find out a lot about it, and you can also drill down to very specific parts. So when you're reading about a given part of the brain, let's say they're talking about prefrontal cortex, they do. And you might want to say, well, what? what is the prefrontal cortex? Well, that's the prefrontal cortex. And you get a little bit of information about it, um, et cetera. And you can look at it, of course, from 30 million angles and get a sense of, of exactly where it is. 
I want to make you aware of, well, the limbic system in general, we could talk about. So let's talk about the limbic system in general. That's these structures. And you see there's a little group of them. And these are, look at what it says, very responsible for motivation, emotion, learning, and memory. Um, and so you learn some of the stuff here. Now we're going to specifically focus on these guys. These are your amygdalas. You have a left and a right. As you see there, small sort of almond sized, almond shaped um, things here. If you're a fan of Spider-Man, um, or at least if you know Spider-Man enough to understand when I say, my spider senses are tingling, that's what Spider-Man would say whenever there was danger around. Something would alert him to the fact that there's danger. You have a spider sense, and this is it. These are it. Uh, a lot of the information, is, as the textbook says, it goes through the thalamus, but, but it also connects with the amygdala along the way. And the amygdala's job is to sense threat. The thalamus is more directing your attention. The amygdala senses threat, and if it senses threat, it is the light switch that kicks in the sympathetic mode of being. Okay, and that's one of the major jobs of the amygdala. If there's danger out there, get the body ready. Kick in that sympathetic nervous system so it's ready to take on that danger. And so if you think of you know, the, this previous one as two modes of being, you can be here or here. It's the amygdala that flips the switch and brings you from relaxation to, to that state. Okay, it is like that light switch of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so I'm going to move beyond the 3D brain. I'm not going to. I, I may come back to it every now and then uh, in my other lectures, but I just also want you to alert it as a as another way of, of learning about the brain that's much more sort of tactile and fun. Um, so check that out. Okay, so let's imagine now that that switch has been flipped. Uh, and we're in the sympathetic mode of our peripheral nervous system. I like to keep saying these things so they start to feel comfortable to you uh, and so that you kind of learn you know, how those terms are used. What's the implication of these? Well, one of the interesting things the brain does is, is it changes where it sends blood. Um, blood contains oxygen and oxygen is critical to the functioning of every part of the body. In fact, with the brain, if we want to see what parts of it are active, what we often do is follow the blood. Uh, and, and when we know where the blood is, that's the part of the brain doing work at some point. That's how things like an, uh, an fMRI, for example, work. I, I may come back and talk about that at the end of the chapter. Um, but what we see when the sympathetic mode kicks in is something kind of interesting. The brain starts sending less blood to the frontal lobes, that prefrontal cortex I just showed you. Uh, and instead, it sends more blood to the limbic system and, and you know to this very primitive part of you. What does that mean? Well, this prefrontal cortex, this is the most newly evolved part of the brain. It's the part that really makes us human. It's where all of our strategies and planning happens. It's how we can build skyscrapers and all the crazy engineering feats we do. Um, that's all prefrontal lobe kind of stuff. But when the sympathetic mode is engaged, you don't have much blood there. And that means that you suddenly have trouble thinking rationally or planning things strategically. It's harder to think when your sympathetic nervous system is engaged. Um, that's kind of like that the message you're kind of getting there is this isn't the time for thinking. There's a danger right there. Some there's there's a window that just broke upstairs. There's a this is not a time for sitting and thinking and deciding what to do and creating plans. No, it's a time to act. Uh, and so the primitive parts of your brain the limbic system area, the parts most related to emotion and survival, they get the blood. And it's kind of like we go back to our more primitive version of ourself, the kind of self that had to struggle for survival every day. And that is what you're in. You're in a survival mode right now. Uh, and so your body feels strong and ready. You feel this imperative to do something, which you know is that sort of fighting and fleeing. So it, it's a mode of action and not thought.
okay? And it can be very cool, very powerful. We hear stories all the time, uh, stories like, uh, imagine this policewoman was walking around and she saw a child trapped under a car for some reason. Uh, and she felt compelled to do something. And she may have went over and literally lifted the car. And you see the shock and awe on these people's faces because they don't think a woman like that should be able to lift a car like this. And in reality, they are likely right most of the time. But when the sympathetic mode is kicked in, she has the ultimate strength. And so people have been known to do things that that seem to require a power that humans shouldn't have, like lift a car. Um, but the idea is she lift a car, hopefully somebody removes that child from danger. She can put the car back down and now the crisis is over. So now she can leave sympathetic mode, right? That is how this system evolved. That is the challenge it evolved to solve. The idea that every now and then in our evolutionary past, we were suddenly confronted with something that challenged our existence. And we either had to fight that thing or get away from it. Uh, and, the, and we were given all this superpower to do those things. But usually we either fought it and defeated it, or we fled and got away from it, or we died. <laughs> There's always that third option. Um, uh, and once we fought it successfully or fled successfully, then the system shuts down. So it's meant to be a short-term response to what we call an acute threat. Acute meaning sudden, strong, but short-lived. You know, something that's just there and has to be dealt with. Okay, so now let's talk about this, you know, sort of approach. If we think of it in the, in the evolutionary sense, this is a, a survival mode for these sudden acute threats that must be defeated or escaped. Like a bear walking out from behind a bush, for example, would trigger this for you. All right. And, and by the way, you know, if I say that, let, let me just let me just highlight. We all know this feeling, right? We've had that feeling where suddenly something scared us and we could feel our whole body like, Ugh, what's going on? Um, that's the sympathetic nervous system uh, in full in full blow. OK, so here's the issue. Now we're getting to, to the, the current times in covid. This notion between acute and chronic. So let's let's first of all, just kind of highlight. Remember when we're in this mode, we have less rational thought. Remember, we're also hyper emotional. Uh, and, and so, you know, if we're thinking in terms of COVID, let me kind of go back here. Let's think in terms of COVID now. COVID is chronic. It's like a bear that won't go away. And, and it's almost worse than that because it's mysterious, right? We don't yet know how dangerous it is. We know so little about it. We can predict so little about it that our brain thinks it's a very serious threat. Um, and therefore, you know, we go into survival mode. But that threat is there every morning when we wake up and it's there all day long. Uh, and so what happens is our system hums along in a in a pseudo survival mode, not a full blown, but you are certainly engaging your sympathetic nervous system and, and feeling those symptoms throughout the day. And those are the symptoms we call anxiety, um, stress or anxiety. You know, those two, those two terms are, are, are used. And so right now we are all in a state of chronic anxiety, thanks to COVID. What does that mean? Yes, it means we're having trouble thinking rationally. It's a tough time to do online learning. It, it can be a tough time to do online learning because doing it well requires planning and strategizing and creating a nice study space and making sure you're watching your lectures on time. Um, you know, all that sort of organized conscientious approach to study, which the prefrontal lobes help you to do, but your prefrontal lobes are not at their best right now. And so it's an additional challenge uh, and, and you're going to have to work at that. Um, that's just true. Uh, we also are hyper emotional. So let's kind of I'll talk about this a little bit. Your limbic system is a little bit active and that's the primitive emotional part. And, and we talk about this fighting or fleeing. What are we seeing? Domestic abuse is rising worldwide thanks to COVID. Now, partly that's because people were pushed together for long periods of time when they usually get a break from one another, <laughs> for, for, so to speak. Um, but they're put together much more closely for a longer period of time. But it's also because those people are both 
ready to fight or flee. They're both at that point where it doesn't take much of a spark to, to turn into fighting, quite honestly. Uh, and so we're seeing things like domestic abuse increase. Uh, and similarly, we're also seeing divorces increasing. Uh, again, probably a reflection of the fact that these, these people are having a harder time living together because they're both hyper-emotional. Um, we're seeing home homicides increase. Um, violence in general is, is at a higher level than it was pre-COVID in the world. Again, because everyone's just ready to fight, ready to fight something. We, you know, Fighting COVID can be tricky, but we're, we feel like we're ready to fight. And if something gives us an excuse to kind of release that, phew, there it is. Um, we're also seeing children uh, being really affected by this, including emotional sorts of disorders in children, anxiety, depression, other things. Uh, and again, not surprising because they are sensing the anxiety, they are sensing the threat, and their brain reacts just like our brain does. Okay, So that's a challenge. We're not as rational. We're much more emotional. Um, and then let me throw this in um, just to just to add another dimension. Um, when we have this anxiety response, one of the ways the brain communicates with the body is through hormones. So it has nerves um, that can connect directly to sensory systems or to muscles. Um, but often when it's just sort of preparing the body for action, for example, it releases this thing called cortisol. Um, which, which helps you in that survival mode, helps you get through it. However, if it's chronic, if this you know, stress continues, then, you're, then your brain is continuing to release cortisol in your whole body. And as that is chronic, we get tired. Um, we get fat, <laughs> fat and tired, great, huh? And we become less alert, less able to control our attention. This is the thalamus, right? You got a little bit of that thalamus directing attention around, uh, but also with the prefrontal cortex that would normally d help direct that. I want to look at here. I want to pay attention to that. Uh, and the prefrontal cortex isn't working as well. Uh, and so we're having problem troubles allocating our attention well. And I want to highlight this last one because it's kind of scary. Um, cortisol. If, if we have enough of it in our body for too long, interferes with our immune response. Uh, it actually makes our immune system less able to deal with challenges that our body may encounter. Challenges like, oh, say a COVID virus. So the longer we're all stressed chronically, um, if especially if we don't find some way of managing or controlling it, then the more prone we all become to catching the virus. You may have heard in the news today, I, I heard it today, where they say uh, the virus is, is becoming more contagious, although not more dangerous. Um, when they say it that way, the virus is becoming more contagious, uh, it sounds like it's the virus itself that's changing. But when I heard that, I was thinking it might not even be the virus that's changing. It might be our ability to fight it that's changing. And so, yes, we might be seeing more contagion, but it could be the same virus just happening with people who have a compromised immune system. And so they're more susceptible to it. Um, that's likely the case. So all of these things point to the fact that in order for us to um, continue to perform effectively, continue to live effectively, we really can't just have this stress overriding us all the time. We need to get some breaks. We need to find some ways to control it. Um, again, the acute stresses are fine. The bears, they're sort of all right, but this guy, you know, um, he's dangerous to us on multiple levels. He's mysterious, doesn't seem to be going anywhere. This is the source of the chronic stress. Here are some other sources of chronic stress, by the way, just to give you a sense, you know, that there's that there's a variety of them out there. But but we're all living under this one, and it has all of those negative effects. And that's why, by the way, when this all started, I could feel the anxiety in myself. I knew I was anxious about COVID. Uh, I could feel it very well. I also knew what was going on in my body, everything I just described to you, uh, and I knew some ways to manage it. Uh, and so because of that, 
I created this course, which is available. It's a free online course. It's just like three weeks with about two hours of lecture per week, something like that. Um, but it's a course I, I, I made available so that other people could understand what they were feeling. And with that understanding, you know, armed with that understanding, then when I gave some strategies and tips that made sense, they could see the sense they made uh, and hopefully would then start using those strategies and tips, not only with themselves, but on their family kind of level, teach, teach uh, other people, these tra- learn them together. Um, and I thought this was really, really important because quite honestly, I think we're going to face a lot of challenges uh, in, the, in the future as humans, uh, existential threats from climate crisis, from you know, future pandemics, from who knows what. And this is a good time for us all to, to understand how our brain reacts to those things and to learn some ways of controlling and managing that anxiety. Because uh, if we can manage it, we can succeed without without you know sort of breaking down and, and then needing therapy or needing some sort of clinical thing. This is, this is kind of like trying to be your best, strongest self. Um, cognitively before you face these challenges. So one thing I will say to you is, hey, if you really want the the long answer to how you can learn this, that course is the long answer. Um, I will though follow this with a with a video that is the short answer um, that that'll give you a, a taste of of some of these things without going into the same detail that I do in that other course. Um, so I'll follow that up next Um, but i will say by the way if you know anybody that's that's really struggling with the anxiety they're facing or heck if you want to do have something fun to do with your parents that that help them or your you know siblings go through the course together um suggest it to them uh it's a great opportunity to to spread mental health um you know real effective mental health advice and to demystify this whole notion that you know some people think that Mental health is just, I don't know, everybody should just toughen up or whatever. Well, sure, toughen up, but toughen up in a way that makes sense. You know, understand how these things come about. It's just biology, really. You know, it's the biology of our body that produces the state in us. And then understand how you can go about controlling it. And if you can do that, you're in much better shape to, to deal with stress in the future. Um, so that's what I kind of hope is a, is a silver lining of COVID is that we all learn how to do this better. Okay, I will come back and give you some highlights of that course uh, in a subsequent video. But for now, I'm going to just shut down here. um, And and hopefully you can now see, you know, how some of what you've been learning about the peripheral nervous system uh, is highly relevant to your experiences every day. Cool. Later, guys.